Hi, and welcome to Talk Straight Bible. I'm your host, Jeremiah Santinetti, and we're looking into the book of Ephesians still and uh, discovering wonderful things. I hope that you are enjoying this Bible study. And you know, it's so simple, but yet, if it is so simple, how come we're still discovering deep things? Because we have an outline, we have a wonderful truth that God gives us in His Word, but we must study to go deeper. I like the saying that says, where there is shallow waters, children wade, but where there are deeper oceans, giants swim. All right, you are the light, so do not be deceived. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 6 through 8. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things comes the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. Well, if we walk as children of the light, we won't be in darkness, right? But how do you know if you're in darkness or you're in the light? Only by this. Only by this. This is what differentiates the light or the darkness from the light. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 4, it says that God separated the light from the darkness. And because of that, we know that darkness and light will not exist together. But yet, as Christians, we can do mine the things of the flesh, and we need to be careful. Paul's instruction and his desire was that they would leave the filthiness of the old life, the unclean things, and walk in the newness of life and the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you know, the Bible tells us in Romans that he wrote, chapter 6, verse 3, For we have been baptized with Christ into his death. We are identified with his death. And he says that we also may be raised up into newness of life, that we may walk into newness of life and in newness of life. But also he also spoke about in chapter 6, I believe it's verse 11, he says that we should not give our bodies over as instruments of unrighteousness, but as instruments of righteousness. And so we are to be slaves of God in righteousness. But he also knew that through these doctrines of darkness that was infiltrating the church or try to, that they could be deceived from the practical way of holiness. And folks, let me tell you something. People are teaching all kinds of doctrines today that are inconsistent, that are not in the Word of God. And we have to be careful and know how to discern between the light and the darkness. And so Paul, you know what? As a matter of fact, when he was teaching at Ephesus, he taught with tears in his eyes. He was so passionate and so concerned over the Ephesian church, as well as all the churches, that he taught with tears in his eyes. As a matter of fact, let's look at that. In Acts chapter 20, and let's look at verse 29. And let's look at through verse 31. And actually 28 says to be that he that, that God placed them as overseers. Matter of fact, let's just go there. Let's, let's start at 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to the flock over which the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, have made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Folks, is that awesome? Christ purchased us with his blood, and it was not just the blood of any man, it was the blood of Emmanuel, God himself. And then he says, for I know this, that after my departure shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Mm. Also of your own selves shall men arise. He Look what he says, from, from right within you men shall rise, speaking perverse things, twisted things, to draw away disciples after them, therefore watch and remember that by the spare, I'm sorry, by the span of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Can you imagine? As he was teaching, he could not hold himself back because he understood that they were they were easily uh, persuaded by things that were coming into the church. And remember, this is the city of Ephesus. 
the city where there was much magic, much sexual immorality, and much idol worship. Very much like it is today. Aren't we not living in the city where there is much idol worship, sensuality, and the, uh, the worship of gods? Come on, think about that. Now, the apostle was concerned over the church because many false teachers had tried to infiltrate it, but he stood as a watchman. He stood as one that was holding out the gospel of light. And he instructed them in the early part of chapter 4. We know that because he says that Christ, God, gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastor teachers. Why? Also, that they will prepare the body of Christ to grow up into the head, unified by the faith of the Son of God and the knowledge of God. Why? Because they would not, uh, so that they would not be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. And ministers of the gospel, you, I'm talking about if you're saved, you are a minister of the gospel. How, how deep you will be a minister of the gospel is concerning how deep you will go into this gospel. And I have a saying, study the word until it studies you. Get a handle on the word until it makes a handle out of you. Why? Because we're to take this gospel into all the world and preach. Yeah. But ministers and gospel, you, ministers of the gospel, we must warn people not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But that we should eat from the tree of life, the word of God in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit and fellowship with the Father. Why? Because this is the way of life. Paul knew that the flesh was weak and that the only way we can overcome was by the power of Jesus Christ. But Jesus said himself that you will know the truth and the truth shall make you free. If we do not study the word of God, we would not know the truth. But only experience parts of the truth. And watch this. If we only experience parts of the truth, we have a lot of pretexts. Now, when you take something out of his contents, the Word of God, if we take something out of his context, it becomes a pretext. And that pretext can be stretched to say anything. For example, I can show you right here in the Bible. It says that there is no God. Do you know that? The Bible says there is no God. But when you look at it, the whole thing says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. See, if you just take a part of it, you can stretch it. But you got to read the whole thing. I like, I like what, um, what uh, a preacher told me one time. He gave me a book and he signed it. And he said, and he said eat the whole row. <laughs> yes, matter of fact, he gave me a Bible. It was a study Bible. He says, eat the whole row. Now, what we do see is that uh, he said, let no man deceive you. Now, when we look at the word man, it's interesting that it took me right back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But when you look at the word beginning in the Hebrew, you will find within the Hebrew letters that make up the word beginning, ish, which represents man. God always had man in mind to create him, that he would become one that would have dominion over the earth, over the fish of the sea, over, over the birds of the air, over everything. But because of the fall, he forfeited that authority. And so what happens is this. His soul became clouded and became somewhat distorted because of the fall. And little by little, the deception gets deeper and deeper. You know, the Bible says, that, again, that Paul said that we must not give ourselves over to, to sin, which leads more into wickedness, but rather that we should walk in righteousness and holiness because it leads to more holiness and righteousness. But the very from the very beginning, we see that God had man in mind. But the false teachers of the flesh were suggesting that they were not sinful. Watch this. That the apostle had condemned certain sins. They said, it's not a sin. See, that's the deception of man. From the beginning, he was supposed to be holy and supposed to be powerful and supposed to be uh, walking in the truth. But after the fall, that same man, as deception uh, settles in, people grow in their own philosophy and reason. Do you know if you sit down long enough and you take one idea 
and you think about it and think about it and think about it without any references, it will grow and you will come out with all kinds of conclusions. The mind can do that because the mind is made to think and to formulate all kinds of thoughts and imaginations and reasons. That's why here, the Word of God, here, the Word of God is where we find God's truth to form our way of thinking, to change the way our imagination works. See, the Word of God has to be in our hearts and in our minds continually. And that's why we need to study. And watch this. They were teaching, well, you know, these little sins, God is not really concerned about them. That's what they were teaching in the Ephesian church, or these false teachers that were secretly trying to gain disciples to themselves. And those that want to do that are actually trying to divert those who are walking with Christ to get out of the way of holiness, and they discourage them by introducing a cheap grace. Watch those ministers of cheap grace. For we know that the ministers of darkness poses as those ministers of righteousness. The apostle Paul said that he and the other apostles were not unaware that Satan was able to transform himself into an angel of light and his ministers as ministers of righteousness. Why? Because he is the God of this world. And the Bible tells us also that the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ that teaches us about his coming, meaning he became flesh and he dwelt among us. It talks about his labor among us. It talks about his death on the cross. It talks about him being put into the grave. It talks about on the third day that God, through the power and the glorious power of his, of his, uh, of his power, <laughs> raised him up from the dead and seated him at the right hand of his pleasure. And there Christ is waiting till the Father gives the command. Of course, he knows when because he's God to come back and to snatch up his people from the earth. And so we have to be careful. And many, Jesus said, will come in my name. These men will come in my name and they will deceive you. They will come as false prophets into the congregation. They will be planted there by Satan himself as tares. Remember that the believers are the wheat. And those who are false prophets and false teachers are the tares. And so he said that he will remove at the coming of Christ, he will separate the wheat from the tares. And we also know that they would come in wolves, and uh, the wolves will come in sheep's clothing. Remember, a wolf can never become a sheep, and a sheep cannot become a wolf. So What's that, sweetie? So he has to disguise himself. He has to disguise himself. He has to become, see, see I'll tell you a lot of wisdom here. You think I do this all by myself? No, it's not. They have to come disguised. And what do they do? They deceive the brethren. And how do they do that? They come with vain words. They come with vain philosophies, many babblings. <laughs> I see that a lot on TV, especially these new age teachers who teach you things about yourself that you don't even need to know, really. It will be, watch this, they come with foolish, filthy suggestions, and they are impure and ignorant of the truth. You know, the, the Greek word for deceive here, as we're looking at the text, some, it means, it means someone that is, uh, someone that is a cheat, you know, someone that cheats in a game, someone that deludes people with mysticness or mischief and takes them out of the biblical way. They cheat people to try to deceive them with ideologies and fleshly reason. Watch that fleshly reason, folks. Teachings that are empty, vain words, devoid of truth, empty-headed, destitute of spiritual wealth, one who boasts of faith as transcending possession, meaning that this person says, I have achieved a certain height and spirituality, and watch those people. The Bible says we grow up into the head, which is Christ, and we grow up into the head by the knowledge of God. Oh, I love this book. This book keeps me out of trouble. My wife says that I get a gleam in my eye when I talk about the Word of God. Mm. Hallelujah. 
We could be talking about baseball and all these things, and it's okay. But as soon as you mention Jesus in the Word of God, I get a glean. I want to. I want to look into Him. I want to see Him. Open my eyes, Lord. I want to see Jesus. To reach out and touch Him. To say that I love Him. Open my ears, Lord, I, and help me to listen. Open my eyes, Lord. I want to see Jesus. Any teaching that does not teach about the Son of God again in His work and His coming and his dying on the cross, and his resurrection, and his seating at the right hand of God in power and authority, and that he's coming back to take his church away and to start all things anew. Watch them. But you must study for yourself. Study to show yourself approved. The word approved means this, as one standing. Hallelujah. Study so that you won't be deceived by evil men with their teachings. Now, what's interesting, he says that they come deceiving you with vain words now the word logos is here the word word and it's the same word that is used by the apostle john in the beginning was the word the logos so here we see that the word logos primarily gives us the idea of anything that is being said or concerning a matter or utterances or things pertaining to communication or reasons by anything written or anything that is concerned with doctrine or intent, anything that is questioning or reckoning something of something else or things or words that are being said, we have to be careful of what we're listening to. And that's why I love what it says in chapter 17 of, of uh, Acts. It says that the Bereans were more noble than all the other people. You know why? They sat there in the synagogue. They must have been a group to themselves. They sat there and they listened intently. And while Paul was speaking, they were listening intently. And they didn't say anything, but they were curious. And so as soon as he finished, they went back to their little chamber and they took out their scrolls. They took out their, their, their readings. They took out all the information and they began to look. Remember that Paul said this and they would look. He says, yeah, it's right here. Yeah. He was right. And the Bible says that they found Paul interesting. It says that this, this fellow is interesting. And so they went back the next Sabbath to hear him again. They were more noble. And if you want to be more noble in the eyes of God, you got to look into the scriptures. Whenever I hear any preaching or anything, and it disrupts that, that flow in my spirit, mm -hmm. the spirit, the spirit of God will tell you, watch it. Mm -hmm. Something is being said. And it could be, it could be the small. You say, oh, but you know, I know, I know what the pastor mean. Listen, I always tell people, I know what you mean, but I heard what you said. And if words are important, and they are, then we need to really pay close attention. Because you never know when false doctrine is going to come at you. And remember, it goes into you, and it begins to formulate. See, these are seeds. Words are seeds. The farmer went out to sow the word of God seeds. And when you take words in and you don't watch it, these words begin to accumulate themselves. Let me, let me you know what? I did a study. Oh, gosh. It must have been about 35, 36 years ago. And I did a study for about three years on the mind. And I was studying about the locusts, and it was interesting about the locusts because the locusts have what is called their avipository. And what they do is they dig a hole and they stick their tail in it and they lay about 30 to 60 eggs there and then they cover it up. And before you know it, these locusts come out of the ground. And I was so impressed about watching the enemy and how he sticks his avipository into our minds. And he lays seeds there, words and concepts and philosophies and we don't even know it's there and before you know it, they start to formulate in our minds. And we say, where is this coming from? It's coming because we allow the avipository of the enemy to be stuck in our minds. Folks, we need to watch. The Bible tells us that our warfare, the warfare that we fight is not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down every imagination that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And how do we fight it? Right here. <laughs> Chop down that thing. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 6, um, ver, um, excuse me, uh, chapter 5 verse 6 says this. 
And because of these things comes the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. We're covering three verses today. The wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. The first thing we have to understand is that the children of God in the Bible are never in reference to the children of wrath. We are not children of wrath. The first thing is understanding that God does not call his children children of wrath. We are saved from the wrath of God. And although we may be disobedient and we may even experience the discipline of the Lord, it is never given to us in wrath. So we need to be careful. But the unsaved, those who do not know Christ, who have not submitted and given their hearts to Christ, they are children of wrath. And listen to this. Those who are unbelievers already carry the wrath of God in them and on them. The Bible says those who, those who believe in Jesus, the Son of God, has eternal life. And, but those who do not believe have the wrath of God already abiding in them. John chapter 3, verse 36. Look at it. And those, watch this, those who are walking with this wrath shall stand before the judgment seat of, of God at that day and be thrown into the lake of fire. Do you know something? I thought about this the other day. What is it going to be like in hell? What are people going to look like? Do you know that there are no clothes in hell? Because what clothes can you wear that will not burn? You know how they're going to go in? The same way they were born naked and burning their flesh will be cooking but yet not being consumed remember that Moses was so curious over the fact that he saw a bush burning but not being consumed and this is what hell is like folks that's why we need to get out there and preach the gospel and bring those that belong to Christ through the gospel do not have fellowship he said so we got to be careful because Paul warns us that to preach the gospel is important. And he said, all those that preach a gospel that is not the true gospel, may they be condemned to hell. But he says, do not have fellowship with them. He said, do not have fellowship with them and do not partake with them. What's interesting is that in the Hebrew, the word being, like I am a being, is haya. And it's the same word with an exception, I am haya, I am that I am. Here, because Christ, God is a living being, he gives us existence. But watch this. They who believe in Christ are not to exist in those things that are darkness because it does not pertain to the truth. The phrase, be not, is in reference to forbidding those things that are ungodly into the being of our existence. Don't let it happen. In their sins and in their acts of disobedience, we need to keep away from those things because watch this, if we, if we don't, we will be influenced and find ourselves discouraged and walking outside of the will of God. Last verse, Ephesians chapter 5 verse 8, call it walkers of darkness in the past. He says, for you were sometimes darkness, but now you are the light or light. In the Lord, walk as children of the light. In the past life, that is the one without Christ, outside of the journey, outside of the way, outside of the truth, outside of the life, we lived in obscurity and shadiness. We didn't want anyone to discover our, dark, our darkness. Why? Because we live in darkness. And Jesus said in chapter 3 of John, John records this. He says, the light has come into the world. But men love the darkness rather than come into the light because their deeds are dark. And watch this. Because their, their deeds are dark, they don't want to come to the light because they'll be exposed. But we are children of the light and we must walk as children of the light, holding out, as Paul says, the light, the light of the gospel, the word of life. And he, in First John chapter uh, 1, he talks about having tasted, having having looked upon him, having be, um, touched him, having handled the word of truth. He says that they wanted to make our fellowship with them and their fellowship is with the word of life. And I love what John says in, in that same passage, 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. He says, now this is the message. God is light and in him there is no darkness. God bless you as you walk in your spiritual journey today. Have a spiritual day. And remember this, you are light. Don't let anyone deceive you by false doctrines because you are walking with Christ.
God bless.